the age-old saying at this point that we only use 10% of our brains is coming into question from a number of different angles when we look at the world of neuroscience, when we look at this idea of our subconscious programming, and when we look at other things, whether it's developmental or evolutionary biology and the trajectory of the human race or something like artificial intelligence and artificial neural networks that are reverse engineered human created synthetic nervous systems that where we're at with our thoughts and our feelings about the present moment that we're allowed to take into account our feelings about the past or the present or the future, that trying to stop our thoughts in meditation, which is a common m misconception perhaps, that there's always going to be waves breaking on the seashore. And once you swim out past the waves, then it's much easier to look at the horizon. But always just remembering that the waves are not the ocean, that the ocean is the waves, but the waves are not the ocean, that our thoughts are products of this greater mind or whatever the source of mind is, whether you want to call it God or the universe or some... Uh, mystery in the machine, that there is a source of consciousness and intelligence it would appear to be in something as simple as genetic code that's carried in all genetic life forms, all carbon-based life forms on this earth, which is all of life. And so we have this process of understanding that when we see where we're at Carl Sagan had this saying in order to bake an apple pie you must first create the entire universe from the Big Bang until now so we have our present moment experience of life and then the infinite process of creation that led up to this moment and then we have our thoughts and feelings about personal reference points being whether it's personal events in our lives or larger global events that we are witnessing or have witnessed and experienced and that our experience takes into account all of that so if you are sitting and reflecting in a quiet space and all of that starts to come up that that's okay that that's in some ways normal and not to be uh, avoided or pushed away that really there is this process of opening your heart to everything that comes and inviting love and peace always and at the same time knowing that you have the strength to welcome any guest in that if Rumi said like feelings or events in our lives are like guests that they come and go so to open these events open to these events wide open arms that we have this radical self-compassion, radical self-acceptance. And when we place less judgments on ourselves, we're able to be more compassionate towards others. And of course, as a byproduct, we're less judgmental of others as well, which, of course, being discerning and making good judgment is different than being judgmental. That you are in control of your actions and yet that doesn't mean you 
just because you have good judgment doesn't mean that you're being judgmental if that is a subtle yet important distinction to make that we can see the depth of the richness of each of our own human psyches like a galaxy and that when our galaxies are spinning in harmony it creates the beautiful music of our lives and that we're all in this beautiful dance of literally being stardust and somehow the stardust swirled up with some water and became animated and we have brains and now our brains are these beautiful swirling galaxies mirrors of the cosmos themselves and to see that we have been created in the likeness of God or in the likeness of this masterful beautiful universe that whether it just happens to be like this or it is some greater orchestration and design that there is a place for us on this earth and sometimes it feels like it's ours to claim like we have a certain birthright if you will and that depending on where you live or what you've been taught that there are all the conditions of life and the rules of life that society and culture makes up and at the same time there's a what someone might say like the founding fathers these inalienable rights of man to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness that's a classic one just that we have the innate sovereignty of being that we are free to choose bliss to choose joy to choose love that we are free to live in a way that is in harmony that we are not beholden to all of the preset conditions of society when that society is necessarily um, not producing the individuals that perhaps can be and to awaken to that potential within every human being is to first start with awakening that within oneself and to understand that we're all a product of our environment that each one of us has a special opportunity to make the most of our environment and to play our hands as best as we can that there's everybody has special or different challenges or opportunities to grow or to expand your frame of reference or your sense of self-identity or your perceived state of being of who you are and what you're capable of experiencing that even something as simple as you don't know how good you can feel you don't know how successful you can feel you don't know until you feel it you don't know until you have the experience until you go and do the thing and to be at peace with where you are now regardless of any whales in your mental seas that are creating great splashes and causing a commotion that there's always going to be in some ways some of these larger lurking 
create cre <laughs> creations and that we can see that anything that say whether it's a wave a big wave on the sea or if it's a whale jumping up and it's something that is let's just say something that we know uh, is important to address and that whale comes up from the surface deep from within our subconscious and it makes a breach and makes itself known and then crashes upon the surface of the ocean making this big splash and we see how the rest of the ocean is generally unaffected there's could even be stormy seas and the surface of the ocean might be affected but the rest of the ocean is still not really affected and when the seas are calm even more so there is serenity all around but even when the seas are stormy and the whales are jumping we can see how calm it is even just a few feet under the surface and this is like our experience of daily life the holding of attention on the bigger picture the understanding that these waves and these whales they come and they go like the guests in the house that we have this experience of the transcendentalness of so much of life all of it really uh, for the most part aside from the state of our consciousness the the ability for us to be grateful or to perceive the connection between the world around us and the world within us and this is an ever-deepening ongoing process and the more that we experience the world as being an extension of ourselves the more that we find this place within ourselves where we transcend our normal identity of the self of the stories that we've told ourselves and we expand to in the simplest way in many ways expanding into service expanding into giving into that simple unconditional love for all beings expanding into that state of pure flow and grace and being that being a channel for that for others that we become the joy of other people and that we become eternal in that process that love is eternal that the things that we think are important now when we look on our deathbed or later on even just five years down the road and wonder about all the things that we were getting stressed out about if they were really worth it and what are the things that really matter that are meant for us that we never had to stress over that are the things that we really needed that were there for us all the time and to take into account these simple things and let ourselves appreciate the moments of our lives so as we reframe our perception we know how to have more good days it's, this is the bottom line Of course it starts with a good night's sleep and drinking plenty of water smiling 
even if you don't feel like it. Working through the process of getting to joy, being in joy, understanding that at the core of every individual is this untouchable space of joy that permeates through all experiences no matter how much stuff gets on top of that however covered up that central jewel the diamond within the lotus of every single human heart that we are all this essence we are all the diamond we all have the diamond the jewel the essence that came with us before we were here that leaves with us when we go and that is the nature of our self our eternal self not our small earth identified self the big identified with the entire cosmos self the galaxy within each one of us the universe within each one of us the connection to that our connection to creation to big time to big space and understanding that somehow in being connected to all of that it puts us in perspective of the smallness and perhaps feeling of insignificance and yet somehow the significance is in direct proportion to the fact that we are a mirror the microcosm and the macrocosm the as above so below the drop in the ocean the ocean in the drop that the entire universe is represented in every single human being and perhaps you could say that about animals or a jug of milk or whatever but humans have the unique place of being able to actually perceive that they are the ocean in a drop unlike anything else and that puts us in a place where we can reframe whether it's our thoughts about the way our life is or it's our feelings about other people or it's our feelings about the way that we want the world to be or it's our feelings about things that happened when we were a child and anything on the layers of the psyche that have been ingrained as patterns into thinking especially the negative patterns and when we start to go big enough and we zoom out far enough we realize a lot of those don't really matter and yet we're holding on to a lot of those patterns and programs because they were what was given to us when we were children and that humans are encoded with information at very early ages and they receive and respond rapidly especially at young ages and therefore in healing our relationship to ourselves going deep within ourselves is not necessarily just about a behavioral or cognitive behavioral therapy kind of process it's not just about looking at these memories and having a box full of memories that we say this is why I am it's more we look and we see that there's a pattern and then whether we understand the source of that pattern say in our life or not that's not as important as being able to 
be aware of the pattern and understand that the pattern changes just by becoming aware of it. That putting a name to something brings us that much closer to addressing it or solving it, if that is the appropriate word. That there's the space to understand that we are using our words to create reality, that the way that we reflect on our memories and experiences and the emotional colors and tones that we give, the more that we reflect on our experiences as learning experiences, the more that we see the silver lining, the more that we practice gratitude, the more we build ourselves into the humans that we choose to be by affirming the people that we are and the qualities that we wish to embody. And this isn't, this is in some ways about getting back to the radical self-acceptance and self-compassion, understanding there is toxic positivity, there is an avenue for being able to use positive psychology to reframe life experiences without sugarcoating it and knowing that you can move on, that there's a reality to life, that everything is change, and that if we hold on to pain, then it makes it hard to accept bliss or to accept the good things that are coming our way if we're still holding on to the things that hurt. So by letting go of the hurt, we let in love, we let in feeling, we let in positive emotion. And oftentimes it does take a strong emotion, a strong action to change or to break a pattern or to break a cycle. And other times it just takes patience and ongoing compassion for yourself and for others and in this process of self-transformation because once again it always starts with you as the locus of control that you don't go out trying to change the world without try without changing yourself first and if you understand that then you become the hub of the wheel and the world is like the ends of the spokes. The rim of the wheel becomes like a rotational vortex and you create a vortex of positivity from within your center. So rather than trying to spin around on the edge of the wheel and get spun around and around and around, finding your center within yourself, finding peace, finding something that is life-giving for you that you live for and sharing that whatever that is it doesn't have to be part of a you know traditional job or hobby and if it is then that's awesome and it's just creating space for you to do what you need to do in a way where you are satisfied and to know that there's a process. The process is longer, perhaps, than you may be aware of, and that becoming who you are is already here. That when we think about who we want to be and we go outside of ourselves to become that, we end up dissatisfied. And when we understand that everything we need to be is already within us, and yet the world is a mirror for us to express that, we 
continue to unfold without mucking up the process. We just let it be the way that it is. And this is the simplicity of wisdom where it's the thing that's most obvious is often right under your nose and yet in that way it's sometimes the most difficult for you to see even if everybody else can see it and when we think about this process of ego and self-sabotage and self-criticism and imposter syndrome and understanding who we are and our dharma and what we're meant to do and getting into this feeling of you know whether it's the all the feelings of judgment and all of that and we by acknowledging those things we let ourselves be aware of them and at the same time by being aware of them we are no longer beholden to hold on to them as ideas that affect us so in the process of unfolding the mind and finding pathways and connections to explore and unfold over and over and over there's the process of no stone unturned and then at the same time there's the process of address the elephant in the room to both look for the least obvious things and also addressing the most obvious things and doing it all with compassion once again in some ways this idea of judgment in a human way is 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 almost like the opposite of compassion that to understand why you wouldn't judge someone for being in the situation that they're in for, from a different standpoint than the situation that they're in sometimes it looks like it's hard to give someone compassion and that at the same time that that's the lesson that everybody from the greatest most successful or most holy spiritual or the smartest or whatever the the greatest to the least everybody is on the same quest or the same journey and to recognize every single person as a fellow human as a brother and a sister and to know that that doesn't mean that everybody's all the same. We celebrate diversity for what it is and, and we let people be where they need to be. If someone is asleep, you let them sleep. You, if somebody doesn't want to be woken up, you don't try, you don't keep banging on the, on the bell to wake them up. It's just a matter of you meet people where they're at and you see who can use help. You can see how you can be of service and find a way to change yourself, most importantly, Certainly a simple way is through a simple meditation practice. Even something as simple as just sitting still and just learning to sit still.
that wherever you are with a uh, religion or a spiritual practice that we can all agree that sitting still without any stimulation from our phone or work demands or other people is something that we're all experiencing this sense of the technological imposed urgency to some degree and to be able to take a step back in stillness and be present with all of the thoughts, all of the feelings, to just allow yourself to integrate where you're at without judging, to be a witness to the thoughts so that the thoughts are not identified with in this intense way that we are still capable of playing our roles without taking them so seriously and yet doing our duty, our due diligence to make things happen and to make the world better and to be successful and prosperous and healthy and happy and loving and kind and creative and the full spectrum of what it is to be a human. And as we sit still, it seems like the weirdest thing sometimes, or to some people, just that it is not a spectator sport to see a bunch of people meditating. And at the same time, it's one of the most fascinating experiences and meditating once versus meditating every day finding that regular rhythm where it starts to be something that's enjoyable and something that you feel is making a tangible difference and it's quite possible that it is the most rejuvenating thing that a person can do. This is why meditation for thousands of years has been systematized into a practice of sitting still. <laughs> for what it's worth, there's an entire science to that. And it goes back for millennia. And sort of like a science of the nervous system, a science of psychology, a science of biomechanics and of some of the deeper questions of life than what we might call spirituality. And in tapping into this state or into this realm beyond the physical world when we are physically still and our breath becomes still and our heart becomes still and our thoughts become still we're calming the waves of the ocean until we reach this state of serenity and all the sort of leaky faucets of our thoughts get fixed or the knobs get turned and all the drip 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 starts to fade into the background we find ourselves beyond that space of ordinary waking consciousness that this space is something that's within us that we can access and yet it's not in this dimension, it's not in space-time. It is an eternal space that exists within us, every person. And this eternal space, this void of creation, of love, is a fountain 
of overflowing joy and bliss within each and every one of us. And that trickle slowly starts to make its way throughout our being the more that we become aware of it. And I wouldn't say that meditation is the only way by any means. It's just a fast way. As ironic as that sounds. Because we're immediately faced with all of our stuff and then have the ability to transmute it into love. And our inner world, wherever it's at, brought into harmony, brought into peace, brought into love, allows us to bring more of that from the outside world into our experience when we accept love as our true nature, as, as the core of our essence. And in India, there's a term called the koshas that says we have these different layers of our body. We have our physical body, and then beneath that, our energy body, beneath that, our mental body, beneath that, our emotional body, and beneath that, it's called our bliss body, the Anandamaya Kosha. And at the very center of that is the Atman, or the soul. And so the soul, this eternal essence of ourselves, is swimming, floating in a sea of cosmic bliss. And as we start to permeate through the layers into the physical body, this is like permeating through the layers of the nervous system, from the central nervous system, the brain and the spine, into the peripheral nervous system of the peripheries, the arms and the legs, and the skin, bones and muscle, and as we move our energy from the surface into the center, moving the energy away from the peripheries, from the hands, the feet, the legs, again through stillness, finding that space within us to access that stillness often is one of the most elusive challenges and it's kind of like the thing that's hiding right under your nose. It's always there. Your breath is always there. That's definitely hiding under your nose. And stillness. And just combining breath and stillness and the practice of listening with an open ear. Doing our best to appreciate all of the thoughts that come our way, knowing that they're, as Yogananda would say, thoughts are universally, not individually rooted. That it's sometimes more accurate to say that even though we commonly say we are not our thoughts, but just that we are like flipping through channels you can tune into different stations of thoughts. William James, the one of the founders of modern psychology, somewhere around the turn of the 20th century, around 1900, said that the greatest ability of a man to reduce stress is ability to choose one thought over another. And we all are faced with choices and these habit, habits that start with thoughts that turn into our character over time that we have the ability to choose our thoughts and choose the direction of our energy. In some ways, it's easier to just choose the direction of the energy 
and try to individually parse out thoughts. And at the same time, we can see how thinking a thought like, oh, why'd you do that, you stupid or whatever, versus I have patience and compassion for myself and I'll do better next time. And, you know, the approach of how to know where success comes from it's not an external thing you can say that yes timing and knowing the right people are all very important and at the same time showing up is the most important thing for yourself and being that light being that space of compassion and showing up doing it for yourself and making sure that your oxygen mask is on and at the same time being there for others. The prayer of St. Francis has a line that says, don't seek to be consoled so much as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all your soul. It's in giving that we receive. It's in dying that we are born into eternal light. John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Finding the mirror of life to hold up for us as a reflection, all of the people and situations and experiences in our life are literally perfect reflections of our own consciousness for us to see a lesson and it's hard to believe at first and over time witnessing situations you can begin to start to program yourself yes perhaps position your heart it's one of one way to put it to set your heart in the right place. Let your head do the work from the, head, the heart being in the right place. The head's very smart. The head does great work. The head needs the heart to be in the right place in order to do good work. And to know that your vision, your eyes, are your guides for this world and the faculties of the senses of all the senses are gateways to deeper understanding but we have to translate the message from our senses in a way that is receivable in a way that we can communicate our interpretation of what we are seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, and tasting, knowing that we can communicate that. And in many ways, first though, before communicating, just perceiving without judging. And the better we get at that process, the more we awaken to this feeling of love and joy that's within us, which ultimately, when we go down these intellectual or spiritual or mental uh, journeys and pathways, that it all returns back to the same source that joy, love, 
bliss, this essence of paradise that is within each one of us and is accessible to each one of us every day through stillness, through paying attention to the breath, through listening, deep listening, that this is available to us. It's the simplest thing that's right under our nose. And in all the pursuits that it all comes back to our feeling of joy and bliss. And in expanding ourselves beyond our immediate points of reference of our roles in life, of our friends and our family, or of our memories, that as we expand our love, as we expand our heart, expand our generosity, and at the same time transform ourselves, we become the change. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day. Blessings. Ooh.